welcome to today's webinar, IFRS 16 Clearances. My name is Milana Fumina and I'm a member of the engagement manager here at ACCO UK. I am delighted to introduce you to today's speaker who has, ha has traveled all the way from China to deliver this webinar. Not necessarily, he's on holiday here. But I'm delighted to have Steve Chen, um, who is also an ACC member, to deliver this webinar for you. Um, Steve um, started off as an auditor. He moved to working as a finance director in Hong Kong for a global consultancy company. Nowadays, Steve works as the managing director of an education company where he maintains a wide variety of clients whom he advises professionally regarding IFRS practical implementation. In 2017, the Guangdong University of Foreign Studies appointed Steve as their accounting industry professor. On top of this, he is a lecturer for several professional accountancy bodies, including ACCA. Back in 2017, one of his students became the first winner of the ACCA P4 Advanced Financial Management Exam in Slovakia. Back in mainland China, Steve now trains finance directors on how to apply IFRS and is the author of the book, The Number One No Nonsense Basic Financial Accounting Theory Handbook, based on the new IFRS conceptual framework. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, cover a few housekeeping points. At the bottom of your audience console, there are a number of application widgets in the news. Some widgets are already open, such as the Q&A, Twitter and resources list widgets. I encourage you to use the widgets throughout the webinar. The presentation is accompanied by slides that automatically changes the present. If you find these are not progressing, you might want to refresh your browser. For PC users, it's F5 button to refresh, and for Mac users, it's Command R buttons. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right area of the slide, or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide. If you look at the resources list widget on the top right hand side, you will find a copy of today's presentation there alongside additional materials, including recent ACA reports on the subject and upcoming events. Please ensure you, you're using Google Chrome as your preferred browser. We want today's session to be an interactive one, so please take the opportunity to send in your questions as we, as we go along using the Q&A widget to submit these. We will address as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. If you're an ACCA member, then this webinar can count as one verifiable CPD unit if it's relevant to your career. You can print the CPG certificate for this event by clicking on the yellow certification icon at the bottom of your audience console. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget marked with the question mark icon. This covers common technical issues. The whole webinar will last about an hour, inclusive of 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Steve. Thanks, Milana, and uh, I'm very excited to be invited by ACCA today to provide a lecture on RVAR16 leases. I'm currently working uh, on a few projects uh, with regards to the implementation of RVAR16 uh, into a few clients' company. I also wrote a book about the RVAR16 as well. So today's presentation, I'm going to cover uh, the following topics. So first of all, I'm going to quickly recap on the basis of RVAR16 leases. And I'm going to move on to the, um, the practical part, it's the lease identifications. It's quite different from the IAS-17, it's the old accounting standards for lease. And then we're going to move on to the disclosure check lists, um, if you're implementing the RFR-16 in your business. Um, and then we're going to touch the idea of selling lease back transaction on the basis, and then we're going to move on to Q&A at the end. Okay, so uh, first of all, it's the quick recap of the... Uh, the basis of our 16 leases. So uh, according to the former chairman, Sir David Tweedy um, of the IASB, he remarked that his lifelong ambition was to fly in a plane that existed on the airline's balance sheet. And now from 2019 onwards, it came to. Because the new accounting standards for leases, IFR 16, solves the issues of off-balance sheet finance which assisted uh, in the um, I mean, old accounting standards, which is the I-17. So before 2019, 
Tesco, for example, is the uh, leading uh, retailer in the UK, restated uh, the financial statement uh, using the latest accounting standards, which is the RVAR 16, and it found there has been an increase of £3.3 billion in liability in its balance sheet in its first half year of 2018 to 2019. And at the same time, the profit before tax and diluted EPS of, uh, of Tesco has also decreased. Um, so, um, because of the combination effect of depreciation expense and interest expense. And also, for example, uh, a lot of businesses such as BP, Royal Dutch Shell, Sainsbury's, Vodafone, and also a lot of uh, airline businesses adopting the RVR16 uh, has been impacted by the standards the most. So, uh, RVR16, that's it. So, the quick recap, what I'm going to do, the best way, is to show you an example. I've taken this example from my book, it's the uh, Charlie and Stella, it's a business, uh, it's a public listed company following the RVR16. Now, um, I'm going to go through the basics, including the lease term and, and, and the approaches that we can use in the um, RVR16 treatment from the lessee's point of view. And also the uh, discount rates we're going to use, for example, the incremental borrowing rate or uh, the uh, interest rate implicit in the lease and so on uh, in this particular example. So let's see this question first of all. Charlie and Stella is the business, enters into a contract to lease a machine for three years. Okay, that three years is simply be the lease term. And of course, you have to remember that in the IFR 16, the rent-free period will also be included in, at, as an example of the lease term. So, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to cover the accounting treatment, mostly from the lessee's point of view, not from the lessor's point of view. So, the lessor agrees to maintain the machine during the three-year period. Okay. So, Charlie and Stella must pay $90,000 at the end of each year. So, that $90,000 will simply be the uh, fixed rental payment, that should be included as a part of a liability, yeah. as a lease liability in other words. But it says, if contracted separately, it's been determined that a standalone price for a lease of a machine is $190,000, which means if I was to buy the machine in the marketplace, I should pay $190,000, so that's a standalone price. And also, the standalone price for a maintenance service is $50,000. Now, according to IFR 16, the lease of the asset is an example of the lease component, and if the lease for the services, and that's called the non-lease component. So, Charlie and Stella can borrow at the rate of 6% a year. So, I'm going to do it, I'm going to use the incremental borrowing rate here of 6%. And of course, according to RFR 16, when you're accounting for uh, the transaction, the rates that you can use can either be the incremental borrowing rate, so, for example, in this case, it's 6% here. Alternatively, you can use the interest rate implicit in the lease. And in practice, of course, um, it is uh, much easier for businesses to use the incremental borrowing rate rather than the interest rate implicit in the lease, especially uh, if you are leasing uh, the uh, property, for example, because for properties, the residual value determination will be much harder than uh, the lease of the equipment and also the lessor's initial direct costs um, in, in determining that property lease will be much higher than the lease of the uh, equipment. So for the simple equipment, of course, practically we'll tend to use the incremental borrowing rate instead of the uh, interest rate implicit in the lease. So interest rate implicit in the lease is just to be the internal rate of return combined a few costs together. So, of course, as the um, uh, practical point for the discount rate here, if the rate that we've chosen is quite high, and what would affect uh, the impact on the financial statements would be, if the rate is high, the asset turnover ratio, current ratio, and also EBIT, the earnings before interest and tax, may also be high. And of course, if you choose a lower rate, this will lower the turnover, current, and the EBIT ratios. And of course, how are we going to determine that incremental borrowing rate? Uh, there's going to be quite lots of uh, judgments for that, and of course, uh, normally, uh, in a business, we can't use the weighted average cost of capital to be the uh, incremental borrowing rate because that weighted average cost of capital will also include other elements instead of just the borrowing part. 
So we need to do a few, quite a few adjust, uh, uh, adjustments in that. And of course, the, the rate will be quite different for every contract. For example, if you lease the asset one and then you lease the asset two, the securities, uh, you provide it for each asset and, and also the lease term and in different economic environments. Uh, I mean, the economic environment, so the asset space is quite different. So the rate will be quite different for each lease contract. Now, so um, the... Let me just summarise the case again. Uh, the lease is for three years, and the fixed rent payment is ninety thousand dollars, and the standalone price for the lease and non-lease components will be one hundred ninety and fifty, and the incremental borrowing rate is six percent. So according to IVR sixteen, there will be, from lessee's point of view, there will be two approaches will be allowed. So the first approach is the separate approach. Second is the combined approach. Separate means that the $90,000 must be split or separated into parts of the lease and non-lease component. And the combined approach will simply mean we take $90,000 together. So let's see the first approach, the separate approach. The separate approach, what we're going to do is to say, right, the machine is the lease component and the maintenance is the non-lease component. And according to their standalone price, each accounted for 79% and 21%. So we simply use that $90,000 and to times by 79% and 21%, which will give us the lease liability of 71,250. So we're going to take that 71,250 and we're going to discount at the incremental borrowing rate. And this particular case is 6% to give us the right of use asset as well as the lease liability. But how are we going to cheat the 18,750? Because that's related to a non-lease component. Because that's non-lease component, and we can't put it into a lease liability, but rather we simply put that into the P&L as the expense. So the accounting cheatment would be, we take the lease component of 71,250. So how we calculate that? We take the $90,000 of the total rental payment and times by the uh, proportion of the standalone price proportion. Of the, of the lease uh, components, and we discount it at 6%, which will give us the present value of 19452. And then for that 19452, we simply do a double entry as to debit the right of use asset, and then to increase the lease liability. So as you can see from lessee's point of view, there will be no operating and finance lease anymore, and all of the leases need to be brought onto the balance sheet. And of course, except for some of the uh, recognition exemptions where we're going to apply the uh, similar accounting treatment as we've seen in the old accounting standards, which is the I-17. But this is outside the scope of today's webinar. And finally, step four is we're going to charge the non-lease component of the remaining of 18,750 directly into the expense uh, to reduce the profit down. Okay, so that's it. And of course, uh, that will be the initial uh, measurement of the right of use assets was the lease liability. Of course, the subsequent measurement for that would be to um, apply the cost model or revaluation model. Or in some of the circumstances, maybe perhaps we're going to sublease the assets to others and maybe we're going to apply the fair value model to uh, uh, take the uh, changes in uh, uh, asset value directly into the P&L. And of course, for lease liability though, for a subsequent measurement, uh, we're going to apply the effective interest method. We're going to account for a time value of money effect for that liability, accounting for the interest expense and also reduction of liability each and every year. And of course, using the effective interest method, you can see that the finance cost will be much higher in the early years than subsequent years. I will touch about that later on. So, as you can see, for the subsequent measurement, we simply uh, depreciate, for example, I'm going to use the cost model here uh, because that equipment needs to be depreciated. And then we're going to simply depreciate it to debit the depreciation expense to increase the expense up each and every year and to reduce the right of use asset value down. And of course, according to a rule uh, from the IVR 16 for the subsequent measurements, if you're applying the cost model, for example, it will really depend on whether or not the asset ownership will be transferred at the end of the lease term. If the answer for that is yes, so what you need to do is you're going to depreciate the asset over its remaining useful economic life. Of course, if the answer is no, for example, if, if the asset is not transferred to the lessee when the lease term expires, 
uh, the depreciation, the number of years that you're going to choose will be the shorter of the lease term and the economic use for life. So that's, the, uh, that's it for the uh, right of use asset subsequent measurement. And for lease liability, as you can see, it's very similar to what we've seen in the um, I-70, it's the accounting standards for lease. It really depends on whether or not your lease payments will be made at the end of each year or at the start of each year. Of course, uh, in this particular case, we're going to assume the lease payment is made at the end of each year. So at the start of each year, we're going to uh, unwind that liability by 11,427. And then we simply debit the expense and to increase the credit the liability. As you can see, in the year one, that the interest expense is much higher than the year two because the year one is 11 and year two is 7.8. And of course, it would reduce further in the year three. And of course, that's the idea of the effective interest method of how we uh, account for the lease liability um, for the subsequent measurements. Of course, uh, when we are paying for the uh, lease payment, so all we could do is to reduce the liability iron to credit bank each and every year. That would be very much the same. Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, how about for the uh, second approach? So the first approach, uh, we're going to discount the um, 70, just to check the figures, we're going to discount the 71,250 at the incremental borrowing rate of 6%. But in the approach number two, we're not discounting that 71, but instead we're discounting that $90,000 at 6% at, uh, for each and every year. So we simply put them together instead of separating them into the uh, lease and non-lease component, and we simply recognise the lease liability of 240. So here's the question for you. Uh, which approach are we going to choose? Approach 1 or approach 2? Which approach would you prefer? And, of course, for a lot of businesses, um, where their non-lease component, which means the services component, the value is high, if you adopt the first approach, uh, that would be much better because we are, we are not going to show the non-lease components as the liability in the balance sheets. But if you were to adopt the approach number two, the lease liability will be much higher. So, for example, for those um, the real estate businesses, they are providing the cleaning and, and maintenance utilities uh, to, to, to their customers. Perhaps the, uh, the value of those um, non-lease components will be quite high. And... If that's the case, if you use the approach number two, it will uh, give you a higher value for liability in your balance sheet and it may upset your uh, uh, investors to a certain extent. Hopefully not. So uh, a lot of businesses um, that their uh, non-lease component uh, is very high, so they will tend to use the approach number one, which means to set them and then to only recognise the lease component as the liability instead of recognising the non-lease ones. Okay, so that's for the basis for the IFR 16, and that sounds quite straightforward, but is that straightforward? The answer is absolutely no. So, in this webinar, I'm going to touch the uh, practical applications for the lease identification um, to see what qualifies a lease and what does not qualify a lease. So to start off, I'm going to give you a simple example. So for example, suppose the company uh, produces wheel coals and sell it to their customers and the company signs a contract with the international shipping container provider. So the, uh, the, the container provider will simply provide services to a company allowing to use these containers uh, when the company wants. And of course, at the same time that the uh, container uh, decorated the container with the company's logo as well. So in this contract, it does not specifically include a keyword, lease. So should we account for the transaction under the RFR 16 or uh, simply put it as an expense? Well, the answer is, according to RFR 16, we need to more focus on the substance of the transaction rather than its legal form. And in this case, to see where not um, we need to account for this transaction under the RFR 60 is to see where not this particular transaction qualifies the definition of the lease. 
And according to Alpha 16, the definition of the lease is to um, allow the lessee to control the use of the identified asset. So, we're going to see whether or not we can choose the use of the identified asset first of all in this particular simple example. Let me just to recap on the example again. Is the company uh, producing uh, the real codes and sign the contract with the container provider? Okay, now first of all, our company can use the container as we want. It's simply because, as you can see, the container has been decorated with our logos in there. It can be only used by our company, of course. And second, uh, whether or not we can direct the use of the containers. Yes, because when we want, we use it. So, the accounting treatment for that is not to show the expense and to credit cash each and every year. Because by doing that, you're doing it off balance sheet finance. And what we could do in this particular case, it qualifies the uh, definition of the lease. And we need to apply the RFR 16 into our accounting treatment by recognising the right of use asset as well as the lease liability as what we've seen before. So lease identification, as you can see in the RFR 16, uh, the RFR 16 provides more practical guidance and steps of how to identify a lease transaction and uh, more focusing on the substance of the transaction rather than its legal form. Okay, now, here are uh, other examples I can give you. The example one. Charlie and Stella enter into a two-year lease agreement. It's a lease contract. Instead of buying it, we lease it with the lessor to use one of the trucks to transport his goods. The, but the lessor can use any of these trucks when required. So the question is, is it a lease contract? Well, in this case, as you can see, um, it seems to be a lease contract, but because we've got a key word, lease agreement, but it's not a lease contract. Well, let me draw you back to the uh, definition again uh, from the ISB uh, for the RFR 16 leases. What's a lease? A lease is where we're going to control the use of the identified asset. So first of all, where not the asset is identified. It seems that, no, because we can use one of those chocks when we want. So many chocks there, and we can use one of them. Not particularly specified. Second, whether or not we can control the use of it. Well, the answer seems to be no. Because the, less, the, the lessor can use any of these chocks when required, which means, from a lessee's point of view, I want to use the chalk today, but let's all say no, because they want to use the chalk today. And as a result of it, from a lessee's point of view, we can't control the use of this particular asset. So the simple answer would be no. We can't apply the RFR 16 here. We can't recognise the right of use asset as well as the lease liability in this particular case. So, just to recap, according to the um, RFR 16, what is a lease? is to control the use of the identified asset. So that's very, very important. If we can control the use of the identified asset from a lessee's point of view, we could obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from it. Okay, so the economic benefits will be in the form of, first of all, um, we may have the exclusive use of this particular asset throughout the contract period, or we can hold the asset or we can sublease it to others, which means for the unused asset, uh, they don't need to be stored at the supplier's warehouse. I mean, if the unused asset needs to be stored in, uh, at the supplier's warehouse, or we don't have uh, the exclusive use of it, and we don't have the um, substantial economic benefit from the use of this asset and this uh, is not a lease. But the question is, what is it, an identified asset? An identified asset is the explicitly or implicitly specified asset. Specified asset, which means the assets uh, in the contract in the first place. Explicitly, which means, for example, for uh, different wheel codes, we've got a serial number there. For a different asset, we also have got a serial number there. It's quite uh, uh, separated. Uh, or implicitly uh, specified. So, for example, um, if I sign a contract with you and uh, you can say in a contract I can use any one of these assets, but in your business only one asset can be used uh, 
to fulfill my contract. So even though it's any one of them, but in essence, it is implicitly specified, I can only use this one, and hence it's a specified uh, asset. Another example would be the portion of asset. So instead of leasing this particular one, I'm going to uh, lease the uh, capacity of it. So it really depends on, for example, the fiber, optic cables, and pipelines that you are leasing. It really depends on whether or not it's physically distinct. So for example, you can use this particular fiber optic cable or this particular uh, pipeline. And of course, if it is not physically distinct, that would be absolutely fine. And if only if it represents substantially all of the economic benefit from it. So for example, that you are leasing the capacity of the fiber optic cables and you are leasing, for example, 95% of, of its capacity. And if that's the case for the portion of asset, it can also be seen that this asset is an identified asset. Okay, now, just to uh, move on to the diagram given by the uh, ISV, so at least we complicated actually. But um, to determine whether or not we're going to apply the uh, least accounting treatment for that, is first question is, is it an identified asset? As I said before, if it is not explicitly identified, of course it does not contain a lease. Of course, if the answer is yes, we're going to move on to the next question on the right. Uh, does the customer benefit from the use of the asset? For example, does the customer have the exclusive use of this asset? Of course, if the answer is no, of course, it's not a lease. If the answer is yes, we're going to move on to the next question. Who directs the use of the asset? So, for example, the suppliers may say, OK, you can use the asset today, but if in some circumstances uh, I want to use it tomorrow, I would take it back from your warehouse. And if that's the case, the supplier directs the use and it is not a lease. But if the customer directs the use, for example, I'm leasing the asset, the asset belongs to our business, and of course, it's a lease. But in some circumstances, there'll be uh, no such terminologies in the uh, agreement. But uh, for example, an example would be, um, the, suppose that you are renting or you are leasing a retail unit um, in the shopping centre. And the lessor may say, OK, um, you need to relocate the retail unit if we want you to do that. So if that's the case, uh, the supplier uh, provided some of the instructions in there. Uh, if the supplier can't change uh, the, for, uh, the, the purpose and, and how we can use the asset, and of course, um, uh, this will move on to the next question, but if the supplier can change that, so for example, uh, I, would allow, uh, I would require you to relocate your retail outlet uh, uh, to another place, I'm not going to compensate you, and of course, uh, it will not contain a lease because the supplier directs the use of it. So, uh, if the supplier can't change the instructions and the customers can use it, the next question uh, for that is whether or not the customer decides the asset. An example for that would be, uh, I'm going to rent the wind farm and the uh, customer uh, may engage an expert uh, at its initial phase or at the design stage of the wind farm, and the engagement of the experts would certainly uh, impact the performance of the wind farm at the end. Uh, if the answer for that is yes, I mean, the customer decides the asset in some way, uh, even though uh, the, uh, I mean, neither party can direct the use of the asset, and the suppliers can't, uh, I mean, can change the instructions and, and so on, the, uh, the contract would still need to be accounted for as the lease contract. Uh, it's a little bit complicated um, diagram provided by the ISB anyway. I summarise the key rules. Um, if you find that helpful, you can uh, uh, take a photo of that anyway, if you want. So just a recap of what we've said. So the identified asset is either we're going to lease a specific asset explicitly specified or implicitly specified or all being identified. If that's for the portion of asset, which means we are not leasing a particular asset, but it's the proportion of it, which means the, uh, it's the capacity part of the capacity of it. So for example, the pipeline or fiber optic cables, uh, we're going to see whether or not it's physically distinct. If yes, it's identified. Uh, if not, 
we're going to see whether or not we can obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from it. If the answer for that is yes, still be specified asset. Oh, sorry, still be identified asset, pardon me. Okay. Now, let's move on. Example 2. Let's put all the theories in, in, into example 2. Charlie Stella enter into a two-year lease agreement with the lessor to use one of these trucks to transport the goods. Some, if there are some problems with the truck, the supplier is obliged to substitute it and repair it for Charlie and Stella. So, we're going to see whether or not it qualifies a lease. Uh, we're going to draw back to the definition of the lease. The def definition of the lease is whether or not we can control the, uh, the use of the identified asset. So first of all, whether or not Charlie and Stella can control it. Well, it seems to me the answer is yes, because unless the truck has some problems, we can't use it, but in any other circumstances, we can use it. And of course, I assume that it's quite normal that the truck has some problems, it's quite normal that the supplier would substitute it and repair it. And to my mind, in this particular case, we can control it from Leslie's point of view. And of course, we enter into a two-year agreement to use the truck. And of course, it's specified in the contract because uh, the uh, supplier cannot have the power to take it back uh, uh, any time it wants. But only under certain circumstances, for example, the uh, trucks have some problems, uh, the truck needs to be returned back to the supplier and this particular case the answer for this is yes it is a lease okay so that's according to paragraph 15 and paragraph 18 that the lessor's rise to substitute the asset is not substantive because it's only under extreme circumstances that the chalk needs to be returned back to the lessor no other uh, no uh, any other circumstances anyway so uh, that's a lease now, let's move on to the example number three. It says, is it a lease contract? Let's see the scenario. Charlie and Stella enter into a two-year agreement with the lessor to use one of his trucks to transport the goods in the country A. But the lease agreement also contains terms and conditions that trucks cannot be used outside the country A. So think about it in this way. If you're a business, can you put some restrictions onto your agreement and say, okay, because we've got some uh, restrictions in there, so it does not qualify lease, and then we don't need to bring it to the balance sheet. Can you do that? Of course, the answer is no. Uh, the ISB uh, has recognised this issue and says that the protective right in this particular instance, for example, is quite normal, that um, you use my car and then can be used in this area, not that area, following my instructions and so on. These are the protective right. Protective right does not, in isolation, stop standard businesses to recognise the transaction as the lease transaction. And hence, in this particular case, the answer is yes. It's still a lease agreement or lease contract. As you can see, I provided uh, the um, explanations according to paragraph 30, according to alpha 16. If you find that helpful, you can uh, take a photo of that if you like. Now, let's move on to the example number four. And this example is taken from the alpha 16 illustrative example number three. So the question is still the same. Does the contract contain lease? Charlie and Stella enter into a 20-year contract with the lessor to use the part of a capacity in a cable. But part of that capacity, which means you can see at the end of the first paragraph, the specified amount is equivalent to having the use of the full capacity of two fibrous strands in the cable, but in total is 21. Which means, as you can see, we are leasing parts of it is not physically distinct because it does not really tell tells us uh, which cable that I'm going to use. It's not physically distinct. So the second circumstance to determine whether or not it's an identified asset will be 
if it represents substantially all of the economic benefit from it, uh, of it, it is an identified asset, but in this case, only 2 out of 21. The answer is no, it's not a lease, because we can't get substantially all of the economic benefit from it, and it is not a f uh, physically distinct uh, asset. Okay, so that's the uh, descriptions, coins of paragraph 20. Let's move on to the example number five. It's Charlie's data and into a 20-year contract with the lessor to use two of the 21 um, specific strands of the fiber optic cable connecting country A and country B. Does it contain a lease? Well, the answer is yes, because although it's, it's two out of 21, it's the same as before. It's, it does not represent substantially all of the economic benefit from it, but here, we can use these two physically distinct strand, and hence it is a lease. So the answer, yes. Okay. Now, as I said before, how we're going to determine the right to obtain economic benefit from this use. So uh, we're going to see either or, either uh, we can use the asset exclusively without any interruptions by, uh, from the supplier or the lessor, or the lessee could hold or sublease the asset to others to, to earn the additional rental income if either or, and we would have the right to obtain the economic benefit from the asset and uh, it meets with the uh, definition of the lease. So, let's see, I think it's the final example, example number six. Does the contract contain lease? So it says, Charlie and Stella enter into a contract to lease a store in a shopping centre for 10 years. The rental payments include payments equals to 12% of the gross revenue. For example, if you've got $100 of revenue, then you need to pay $12 as the rental payment to the lessor. And from lessee's point of view, we've got the rights to determine which products to be sold and store design, which means we control it to a certain extent. And um, the contract requires Chinese debtors to make fixed payment and also variable payment based on the percentage of sales from the stock. So remember, according to the IFR 16, the variable uh, rental payment relating to the performance cannot be included in the lease liability, but only when the, uh, the variable lease payment um, that includes, uh, that will be uh, variable or adjusted according to the inflation effect can be included in the lease liability. Lessor provides cleaning and security services and advertising services as part of a contract. So as you can see, we are leasing a particular store and it is identified and we can control it because the lessor would not necessarily interrupt the use uh, 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 interrupts our use of the of the store because we can control it, we can design so on. So the answer for that is yes, it is a lease. I can see it, so you can see a description for the this particular example. If you want, according to paragraph twenty three. Okay, now let's move on to the uh, next topic. Is the presentation and the disclosure. Part. Okay. Okay. Now, for lessee's point of view, what we're going to present, uh, of course, is the right of use asset as well as the lease liability. For the lease liability, it needs to be split into non-current and current liability, uh, same as what we've seen in the I-17. And the PNO, we present the interest expense and depreciation expense from lessee's point of view. And in the cash flow, uh, we're going to separate those cash flows. For example, the um, for the interest payments, still be a choice in the financing operating activities, and for the instalment relating to a principal, excluding the interest part, we're going to put it into the financing activities and so on.
And for the disclosures, as you can see, it's very standardized items here. But uh, according to the uh, IASB, instead of using a more prescriptive approach in disclosing the parts, uh, for example, the, uh, the leasing activities into your uh, financial statements, but now the ISB said you need to focus more on the substance of the transaction. And in this particular case, as you can see, we focus more because the, um, the world is changing quite a lot and the transaction is quite complicated uh, in, in a lot of businesses, particularly with variable uh, lease payments. So one of the examples I can give you is that perhaps a company signs a, a contract with the lessor uh, to use a particular store, but the rental payment will be based on its revenue. So, um, for example, if you make no sales revenue at all, uh, I'm going to charge you $1,000 of the rental payment. But if you make any sales revenue, I'm going to charge you $2 million as the rental payment. It's quite variable, but in substance, it's fixed. Because for that store, the possibility to earn no sales revenue is almost zero. And hence, in the first circumstance, if you make no sales revenue at all, uh, you uh, can only pay $1,000 of the uh, liability. So some of the businesses may try to think, okay, I'm going to structure the transaction like this, and then I'm going to recognize the liability simply be $1,000 into a balance sheet instead of $2 million. Is it allowed? Of course, the answer is no. Because we also include the in-substance fixed payment, although in its legal form, it seems to be quite variable. Of course, there'll be uh, lots and lots of other examples I can give you, um, but um, just checking the timetable. <laughs> it's quite near to 15 now. But anyway... So the disclosures, we need to do quite a lot of uh, adjustments in there from Leslie's point of view, particularly if the transaction is quite complicated, ongoing adjustments would be needed. So finally, uh, we're going to touch on the seven lease back transaction. Uh, in the past, a lot of businesses would structure the transaction as the sale and operating lease back. And the consequence of which is that under the old accounting standards, from Leslie's point of view, we sell it and then we operate and lease it back. And then uh, I can improve the return capital employees because the asset has been de-recognised into our financial statements and we can recognise uh, the profits or gains or loss into our income directly, boosting up the profit. But under the new accounting standards from Leslie's point of view, there will be no operating or finance lease anymore, which means if you're... Uh, uh, structuring your transaction under the sale and lease back, uh, one, it is not as attractive as what we've seen before in the old standard. Because under the new standard, from a, lease uh, from a lessee's point of view, if you are structuring your transaction under the sale and lease back, what you need to do is to bring it back onto your balance sheet, recognising your right of use asset as well as the lease liability. So a sales lease back would simply be, we sell the asset, we get the cash and then we lease it back. So we get the cash and we pay the rental fee each and every year or every month. So uh, the seller will also be the lessee in this particular case. Now, if the transfer is a sale, we need to do the following accounting adjustment, which means when we sell it, we debit bank and we credit our PPA and then we lease it back. We need to recognise the right of use asset and to recognise the lease liability. And we put the final figure, that's the balancing figure, into the p and directly. Of course, if the transfer is not a sale, according to IFRS 15, example would be the sale is refundable. And what we need to do, we recognize, when we receive cash, we need to put that on, onto the liabilities, well, the financial liability. So let's see a quick example here. Is Chinese seller uh, structure its transaction under the sale and lease back and sell it for 5 million, uh, which means we debit bank of 5 million. Uh, at the time of sale, the carrying value of the equipment was 1.3. We simply credit the PP of 1.3. It seems to be we make a gain of 3.7. So can we recognize the 3.7 gain into our PL? But the answer for that is no. So, 
second paragraph, China instead enters into a contract with the buyer to use the equipment for the next six years. Remaining economic use for life is six years, and the rental payment is $600,000 to be made at the end of each year. The interest rate implicit in the lease 10%, and we simply calculate that uh, rental payment to discount it at the 10%, which, we, which gives us the present value of the uh, lease liabilities to 2.6, which means we simply credit to increase the lease liability of 2.6. So, so far we debit bank of 5 and credit PP of 1.3 and then we credit the lease liability because we are leasing back uh, because it's the same lease back anyway. So, the next step is we're going to recognise the right of use asset. So, the right of use asset, as you can see, the carrying value of the PPE was 1.3 and we could only recognise part of that 1.3 as our right of use asset. In this case, because the lease liabilities, 2.6, accounted for, if we take 2.6 divided into $5 million of the fair value of the equipment, we only recognise that part of the right of use asset, which means 2.6 divided into 5 and times 1.3, that would become the right of use asset value to be 0.8 million. So we simply debit bank of 5, credit PP of 1.3, and then we lease it back debits the right of use asset, credits the lease liability, I'm going to put the balancing figure to a profit. So instead of recognising the 3.7 as the full profit into our PL, we're only recognising part of that. So it seems to me, uh, it seems to lots of businesses, that the selling lease back is less attractive um, uh, the, after the RFR16 comes into being anyway. So, um, that's it, I think. Uh, so the final section will be uh, the Q&A. Uh, I will try my best to answer your questions. If not, you can always drop me an email at the end. I'm going to answer your questions uh, after the webinar. It's also fine. So any questions, please do let me know. Thank you.